Hello and welcome to the Fantasy Flex podcast presented by PrizeFix. I'm your host, Samantha Praviti. As always, I will be answering your mailbag questions every Thursday on this podcast, which you can submit for future shows to mailbag at actionnetwork.com. As always, I am so excited to be joined by Brandon Anderson, my BFF, NFL and NBA writer here at the Action Network, who you can find on Twitter at Wheaton Brando. Brandon, how's, how's dual sport life going for you? It is, it is going. Uh, there, there's a lot happening right now. I do not write about baseball at the Action Network, but I'm a little relieved that the baseball season has wrapped, that the Atlanta Braves are World Series champions. I just don't have time to watch baseball every night on top of covering NBA and NFL, but it's very happy for the Atlanta Braves. My grandmother in the 90s, after my grandfather passed away, she needed something just kind of to fill the evenings. And in North Dakota, as in most of the country, we got the Cubs and we got the Braves because they're on WGN and on TBS. So grandma started watching the Braves every single day. She knew about Chipper Jones and Tommy Glavin and Greg Maddox and all the guys. So I was very happy for the Braves to win for my grandma last night. But I am also glad to uh, focus a little more on football and basketball going forward. I love that. Well, speaking of football, what a year today has been for the <laughs> oh, NFL. Man. We are recording this midday ish on Wednesday, November 3rd. And just so, so much is happening. Odell Beckham may be released. I don't know. There was like obviously a lot of rumors yesterday. As you mentioned in our group chat, the Browns probably tried to shop him and couldn't, so he may be getting released today. Don't know like where a great landing spot would be for him at this point. Um, and then obviously the news with Henry Ruggs coming out, um, devastating news all around. So it's been a rough day. Oh, and then of course, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, by and, the way, Aaron Rodgers. Oh, and by the way, Aaron <laughs> Rodgers. Uh, yeah. With the... Uh, sus vaccination situation um we, i guess we were all under the uh assumption that he was and he wasn't so he will miss this game against the chiefs so that is a really big deal and um yeah do you have any thoughts on the giant news cycle <laughs> news dump that we just had on this wednesday yeah it, it has been a morning there's a lot <laughs> happening right now I, I'm kind of ticked. Like I, I like I realize we're in pandemic and this is just we're, we're rolling with it. But for two weeks in a row now, we had like the game of the week was supposed to be this huge Packers game, and we got the Packers Cardinals ruined last week when Devonte Adams went out. It ended up being a very good game, but the line moved a ton and took what was supposed to be this this great game off the Thursday night calendar. And look, Patrick Mahomes and. Aaron Rodgers are only scheduled to play once every four years. That's how this works until of course Rodgers goes to Denver and then we get them twice a year, but we we've never seen these guys play each other. And for me, that, like that's two, maybe the two most talented quarterbacks ever that I've ever seen play. Like I want to see them play each other in their primes, not when they're 45, like Tom Brady someday. I don't know. Maybe he's still in his prime too, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a bummer. It's a bummer not to get to see them play. It is a bummer to, you know, obviously the trickle down is more like a, a landslide waterfall avalanche down when it's Aaron Rodgers. So we'll see. We'll see if the Chiefs can actually play, uh, get a win against Jordan Love. Maybe this is the Jordan Love, uh, you know, the beginning of something big and beautiful. What if Jordan Love comes out and puts up like six touchdowns and gets the win and like it, is there, is there a non-zero chance? Just, just ride with me here for a second. What if Aaron Rodgers just never plays for the Packers again? Like, what if Jordan Love comes in and plays? Rodgers, at soonest, I think, is able to return next Saturday. So there's a chance he could end up missing more than one game from this here. We don't know details yet. We don't know who else will be there. What if Love plays a couple of games, looks great, and Green Bay is just like, yeah, we're moving on from Rodgers after this year anyway. We're feeling good. It's love season now. Like, I know it's absolutely outlandish, but what if? What if that would happen? I mean, th there's a non-zero chance of all things happening. That's <laughs> right. So, yeah, sure. I would actually love to get your take on Jordan Love from, like, a scouting report standpoint, just because he is a guy that there was – 
obviously a ton of drama around the draft the first round the Packers trading up to 26 to get him so aggressively he was a guy that had one really strong season at Utah State and then one season that was marred with uh, a lot of turnovers so he's kind of just regarded as this gunslinger that's not super refined and maybe is not NFL ready or anything like that and we have now this is pretty much a black box because he didn't take one snap last year and now he's taken you know he had like seven uh, attempts this year in week one in like the Packers meltdown against the Saints. So really, we don't have a great sample size to go off of. So a lot of people actually did think he was just not NFL ready. And they thought he was just going to stay in college in 2020, transfer to a power five program or something and kind of boost his draft stock. So I'd love to hear what you kind of think in terms of a scouting report and what we can expect from him, even as like a fantasy asset and what it means for like guys like Devontae Adams. Yeah, that's, that's a big question, but I, I'm excited to see. And it's really fascinating that of all games that Rogers misses and love suddenly as the starter of all times, it comes against Patrick Mahomes because yeah. going into the draft, that was the name that we kept hearing. and. It's not fair. It was never fair. Patrick Mahomes is like the most talented quarterback in NFL history, potentially comparing anyone to him or to Rogers or to any of these names is going to be a fool's there. And you can't live up to that. You just can't. But I think what the comparison was is, okay, we knew Mahomes was going to be a project. We knew he wasn't ready coming into the draft. That it was going to take a little time. The chiefs knew that they put him behind Alex Smith. Even the Alex Smith to Aaron Rodgers thing is interesting because, of course, they were the same draft back in the day. And so love being behind Rodgers, waiting his turn. He, he's toolsy. Like, that's the, that's the term you kept I was hearing in the draft about Jordan Love is toolsy. What that is code for is he's not good right now. <laughs> he's, okay. Well, he, he's, he's got talent. He's got a huge arm. He can run. And you see the flashes when you watch the film, you're like, oh man, there's something that could really be here. And then you see the next play and you're like, oh man, he just telegraphed an interception, stared his guy down and threw a pick six right into the defender's arms. And he just did that last game too. And he's going to do it next game as well. So that was the problem It is okay. The raw talent is there and more and more in the NFL. What's really fascinating to me, those are guys that when the draft comes out, I fade those guys. I don't want any part of them because over the years, we've seen so many players bust that way, but more and more today in today's league, we're seeing smart, good teams draft these toolsy guys, Josh Allen, Trey Lance this year, guys who are not ready yet from these smaller schools. And then saying, well, I would have rather go down with a ship on a high upside guy, take my chances, then end up with, you know, a Kirk Cousins or a Ryan Tannehill or one of those guys where Mac Jones maybe falls into that mix where it's like, okay, we can get something good out of him, but can we get something great? I don't know if we can get something great. Jordan Love, I think, is a swing at something great. And when you swing at something great, back to the baseball thing, you might strike out. Mm -hmm. So Jordan Love might be a strikeout. We don't know what we're going to see on the field this week will be very different, hopefully, than anything we've seen two years ago when, you know, when he got drafted, because that is the whole point of giving him some time and awaiting. That's the point, like with Trey Lance, much as we like to see him out there, the point is draft and let him grow and learn and how to develop all those tools into something real. So I, I, I don't know. All of that doesn't get us anywhere. I think for this week alone, you could do worse. It's the chiefs after all, you know, like uh, what would you, who, where, where on your rankings, where would you put Jordan love? Is he a top 10 play? Is he a two quarterback only play? Where would you put him? Two quarterback only play. And like, that's not saying too much given there are four teams on by. So I, I mean, I think he's, he's startable in those formats but I just have no idea the range of outcomes here is just so so wide and you know hey we could see Blake Bortles for all we know I don't know I mean I I, I guess I, I'm wondering too like if you're if you're saying that Patrick Mahomes is an unfair comparison which I also thought was an unfair comparison what do you think is a better comparison like even yeah. if it's not one-to-one -one, like for instance people compared 
Mac Jones to Daniel Jones, just less athletic, like some, something like that. Yeah. What it's hard because these comps are hard because you have such a narrow, you know, there are only 32 NFL quarterbacks. So there's just, there's not a, and, and like 12 of them at any given time are terrible. So they're not people you want to compare them to. So when you only have like 20 to pick from at any given time, there's, there's not a lot of choices here. I remember watching him at Utah state the first few times and just seeing the, the tools and the talent, what, what immediately came to mind to, for me was Colin Kaepernick. And I know that's another spicy name to compare someone to, but to me, just, you know, seeing someone in, in the mountain West. So of course that's a name that obviously comes to mind, but he, 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 the running ability and the long stride and ability to make plays that way, I think really jumped out to me. And from a fantasy standpoint, that's what gets you excited because, you know, quarterbacks, if you're a pocket only passer, you are, it's hard to get big points out of you in fantasy. Like you either need to be Tom Brady and throw four touchdowns every week, or you need to be able to run the ball now. So to me, that's the upside and why I would say Jordan Love, I haven't looked at all the quarterbacks this week. I would put him maybe in like the 10 to 15 QB range only because for this week only, but when you're a new quarterback that doesn't really know totally what you're doing, your tendency is going to be to tuck it and run more often. And that's the one thing I'm pretty confident Love can do. I don't know if he can read the defense yet. I don't know if he's going to be throwing pick sixes. If you're in a league that gets potentially massive penalties, like I had leagues where you get a minus touchdown if you throw a pick six, I'm not playing him. Like there, there's a lot of downside there. But if your league has more upside for rushing or, you know, I, it wouldn't be shocking to see him have a 100-yard rushing game or to break a 50-yard running touchdown or something like that. So that to me is the upside from a fantasy standpoint. I don't love it for Devonte Adams. Like the whole thing with Adams, he's a great receiver. Absolutely. He's coming off of COVID protocols. We don't really know what that means for him, but what you love about Adams is the chemistry with Rogers. They're always on the same page. Rogers always knows where he's going to be and gets the ball to him accurately. Jordan love is not an accurate pastor. Like maybe he is now, but the last that we saw of him, he's not accurate. He's more accurate to the other team than he is to his teammates. Sometimes he didn't have a lot of help either. So that's fair, but I'm not, you're not going to bench Devonta Adams against the chiefs. You have to play him. You just have to hope maybe get the touchdown, but it's, it's not exciting for him and for the other guys. I, I would say if there's one fancy takeaway, I said this in our Slack too, to me, it's AJ Dillon and Aaron Brooks or sorry, Aaron Jones season. Those are the guys I want to play because I think they're going to run the ball a lot. They've ran the ball very well recently. And, you know, you want to run anyways to keep the Chiefs defense on the field and Mahomes off the field. And if you've got a, a quarterback making his debut start, all the more so. So in like a DFS especially, I'd be looking to play one of those guys most of all. Yeah, I definitely like them this week. I said it was like net neutral, maybe a little positive just because I think that maybe game script might not like lend itself yeah. to a ton of running but I also think that they may need to like Matt LaFleur may not have a choice if Jordan Love <laughs> really starts playing really poorly like we've definitely seen teams like just completely abandon any kind of passing game if something starts to go wrong like that with the backup so um interesting game to watch I guess uh yeah it's a bummer that we don't get to see the Mahomes Rogers showdown but it's still football and we will be marching forward so why don't we move on to our favorite segment play hold drop uh where we put on our professor caps to help you guys make some transaction decisions, um, lineup decisions, whatever. So why don't you hit me with the first list of guys? All right. Let's start with our quarterbacks for this week. So we've got three quarterbacks. One of them I think was in our PhD last week. So Ryan Tannehill is back again. We love Ryan's. Hello, Ryan. Good to see you again. Kirk Cousins and Tua Tagovailoa are the other options. So what do you think between those three play, hold, or drop? So with Ryan Tannehill, just on the note of the cluster of news, obviously we have <laughs> lost Derrick Henry for at least six weeks, more likely eight. They're saying six to 10 possibly. Uh, so that's kind of like top of mind. I think a lot of people do think that Tannehill could make a big jump. This is a tough matchup though. And um, I think that I would say I'm going to play Kirk. Your, your boy, Kirk, I like that, against the Ravens who are allowing a ton of passing yards. 
I think I would hold on to Tannehill to kind of see what this offense ends up looking like without Derrick Henry, without that security blanket. And then Tua has the best matchup, but if I have to drop one of these guys, it's probably Tua. Yeah, I'm with you on dropping Tua. He's really only had one good fantasy game against, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So there, there's not a whole lot to hold on to there. I'm not excited about really much of anything on that offense. So he's the drop. I do... I am intrigued by Ryan Tannehill's long-term upside. He's definitely not a drop for me. You know, he's only had three touchdowns twice now, both against Indianapolis. So that's not a great sign. But in in researching for that game this week to write about it, I was surprised Tannehill's numbers, you know, the last couple of years, we were surprised to see just how efficient he became. And I wondered, would that fall off this year without Arthur Smith there? And it looked like that happened. The first few weeks, he looked like turned into a pumpkin, like the old Ryan Tannehill back from the Miami days. He looks like recent Ryan Tannehill again. He's over the last four weeks, he actually is number one in EPA expected points added of all quarterbacks. So I wonder what that's going to look like with Henry out. On the one hand, it should be more in passes. So that could be good. On the other hand, I think what has worked well for him is the play action and does the play action work as well when you don't have King Henry back there? So, yeah, I, I agree. Kirk Cousins, the Baltimore's secondary has been a little leaky, so I like the play a little better this week. But of the three, Tannehill is the one where I'm like, okay, he might just be a like a steady QB one now going forward. AJ Brown has looked finally healthy again, and like of the of the three here, he's the name that stands out, even if it's not necessarily the top choice this week. Dude, that magic burrito, whatever it did to AJ Brown, he's actually been really good since then. So well, we've we've all had a few magic burritos in our <laughs> lives. Let's let's be honest. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. Uh let's let's hit. So trust me, we, we've got more to say about Derek Derrick Henry to come. So in our running back list, we have one of Derrick Henry's potential replacements, Jeremy McNichols. We've got Kenneth Gainwell and we have De Ernest Johnson. So play, hold, or drop, or maybe just drop, drop, or drop. Where are we at on these guys? Oh, these guys are so droppable right now. <laughs> but I, I wanted to make these lists like very similar groups of guys, and maybe you would have a different opinion or whatever. Okay, Kenneth Gainwell is dead to me. Absolutely dead to me. <laughs> After that, I, yes, they killed Kenny. I am very upset. Uh, I have been personally victimized by Nick Sirianni, and I would like compensation for that because I told everyone and their mother to start Kenneth Gainwell last week. All the tea leaves seem to be pointing that way, except right before the game. Did you see the Philly beat writer from uh, The Athletic was like tweeting that Gainwell was like not working, not doing pre warm up and stuff Ooh. with like the first team? And I was like, oh God, something's wrong. They were like Boston <laughs> Scots out there. And I'm like, it's too late. I can't take it back. Um, and you know, actually, one of my biggest lineup decisions was Kadarius Tony or Kenneth Gainwell. Turned out it didn't matter. But uh, yeah, he is dead to me. I think that he is droppable at this point. I um I I think a lot of people are really high on Boston Scott now, and I'm just low on everyone there. So <laughs> I'm I'm okay with dropping Gainwell, shooting him into the sun, whatever, whatever floats your boat, even in a good matchup. I don't I don't trust him. I I now just completely have trust issues. Um uh, of the other two. Let's see. I mean, Dearness Johnson had a better game than Nick Chubb last week. Chubb clearly is not a hundred percent, I think, right now, but I'm not sure that I'm like necessarily willing to play him. McNichols is also not a guy that I'm really high on either. I think he's just gonna be a change of pace type guy behind Adrian Peterson. And I don't know how much playing time he's actually gonna see. They're gonna do some kind of weird committee and Mike Raybell is going to like cut off his junk and sacrifice that to the Super Bowl gods. <laughs> and, um, again. Whatever. Yeah, again. Uh, I don't know how many times you get to pull that card, Mike Raybell, but um, I guess like, I guess I'm going play McNichols and keep Johnson just because with Chubb and Hunt both not healthy, I think he is a useful insurance policy to keep. Um, and yeah, drop in game well. What do you think? Oh uh, yeah, I think I'm dropping them all. <laughs> I, I, that, I, that's that's the exercise, I Brandon. I, I understand. Oh, I've never, I've never really been great at exercising. Let's be honest. Uh, here's the thing with Gainwell is 
if you look at just the numbers, you see 13 carries for 27 yards. Yeah. And it's easy totally to be like, though. yeah, very misleading. It's like, well, you know, at least he got 13 touches. That's not so bad. Literally one touch before the fourth quarter. Yep. Like he was barely even the on the final field. two drives. That was all his touch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's because you're playing the Lions and you're ahead like 400 to nothing at that point. So it's like, all right, fine. Let's let <laughs> Kenneth Gainwell on the field. He can have a few carries. So yeah, it sucks because they're playing the Chargers who have no run defense. So this would be the week that like, I don't know. I, I almost, despite that, given these three options, if I have to play one of them, I might just play Gainwell and hope that it's such a bad deal. Like, I just don't think I'm missing much on the other two guys. If I have to play someone and my choices are like two points from here or three points from here, I'd rather take the probable zero and like maybe Gainwell actually gets touches. Maybe, you know, I, like it, I don't feel like I'm giving up much and I'd rather have the potential upside, even though it probably doesn't exist. Dernis Johnson, the upside is if Chubb misses again. Otherwise, like, you know, he only got four carries, I think, last week. So he got the touchdown, but otherwise, but yeah, it yeah, there's not much there. McNichols literally has seven carries all season. So like the, he's, he's the passing back. So maybe you get an extra catch or something. If it's PPR, at least, you know, full PPR, you get a little bit of a floor there. And maybe he's like a five or six pointer. I don't know. It, it's rough. I, I, I feel like I, I personally wouldn't mind cutting to Ernest Johnson if I needed the roster spot for someone. Like I wouldn't rush to cut any of these guys just because running back, you just need chances. And all these three guys, you can see the upside, but all yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all very cuttable. They're all very tradable. If, if I have to choose, I think I will play Kenneth Gainwell. Holy cow. That is a sentence that I just said. <laughs> And I guess I will keep Jerry McNichols for a week and see what it looks like and cut to Ernest Johnson, but, you know, put him into a blender and see what comes out. <laughs> All right. Receiver. We have a little bit more palatable names here. So we've got Emmanuel Sanders, Jacoby Myers, and Devante Smith. What do you think? PhD for those three. So Sanders is the locked in start uh, play or starter for me. He had a kind of off game for sure. And it was more like the Cole Beasley game, but this is a really good bounce back spot against Jacksonville. I think that he is in a league of his own compared to these two guys. So Myers is just, he's getting targets, but he's not doing anything with them. He like can't find the end zone to save his life. It's a difficult matchup against Carolina who are allowing the second fewest passing yards in the NFL. So, and then Devonta Smith, I want to believe in Devonta Smith. Like I still have hope for him because I think that he has so much more potential than Myers. I would say like, yeah, there are limiting factors, mostly being Jalen Hurts and the Eagles offense, but I'm probably holding on to Smith and I would drop Jacoby Myers. He's not interesting to me. He's like a guy that you might get seven points from every week, but like, I'd rather at least have the other guys that have touchdown upside. Yeah. I think it depends maybe a little bit on your league format. If it's a full PPR, if it's a deep league where you're actually having to start like four receivers every week, once you add in the flex positions, now Jacoby Myers is valuable because He's 68 targets for the season. That's over, you know, eight and a half a game, I think. So he's getting catches. He's going to put up like four catches, 40 or 50 yards a week. That's a high floor. It fills a lineup spot. If you're in a deep league, if it's PPR, you're getting eight, nine points. That's not nothing. You know, we just talked about Kenneth Gainwell and Jeremy McNichols for three minutes. So I'd much rather play Jacoby Myers than those guys, but you know, it's literally a joke at this point, like actually a joke that Scott Hansen makes every week in NFL red zone about how Jacoby Myers just can't get into the end zone and score a touchdown. He's not a red zone threat. So yeah, you're not losing a lot. Myers is the exact sort of guy that I don't roster in leagues usually because mm -hmm. I just don't really need those kind of back end high floor, no ceiling guys. If it's a deeper league that changes a little bit, but yeah, I like him but he's not doing much. So I think Manny Sanders is the play just because he's the most consistent guy right now. He's getting like three to five catches a week, 50 to 70 yards. Buffalo, nice matchup. The Jaguars are last in the NFL and passing DVO at defense. So definitely that's the play for the week. 
Devonte Smith, we've talked about him. I like him. He's not super playable right now, but he's also got upside. So if, if I'm going to hang on to him or Jacoby Myers, I'd hang on to the upside. So I, I, I'm with you on this one. Same three. I'd play Manny. I would keep Devonte and begrudgingly drop Jacoby Myers. But I think I'd probably try to find a way to keep him around just in case. Yeah. Let us do our final set. All right. Tight end. We've got CJ Lazama. It's, that's how I learned this week. That's how we say CJ Lazama, not Uzoma. He, no. he had a whole video this week that came out. Like after his big game a week ago, they did a whole social media thing for him. So CJ, I apologize. CJ Lazama at the Bengals, Noah Fant and Dan Arnold. One of those hot new names from the Jaguars. What do you think about Arnold? Is he in this mix for you? This is so difficult because it's one, a really bad matchup. I know he's coming off of a monster game where he had like a million targets. This Jags offense is just so unpredictable. Like we literally talked up Marvin Jones for like two of the mailbag questions last week. And I was saying like, he's consistent and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like the Dan Arnold's game. Of course it is. And the Jamal Agnew game, because of course it is. So I just like, I don't really trust Arnold. I actually like feel like he's a serviceable streamer if you need him, but I'm actually fine with dropping him this week in a really, really tough matchup. Um, I would hang on to fan. I know he's like banged up. And I just think that the, the upside is there. And Uzama, I think... He did have an off week after I finally got on the Uzama train, uh, picked him up in a lot of places. And of course he was a dud last week. Obviously a lot of weird things happened in that game. The, the Jets won a game. So anytime that happens, I think it's just a weird game. Um, I still think he is a major part of this offense. Remains touchdown dependent, but so are most tight ends. So, um, and I think Cleveland's defense is exploitable. So I would probably say play Uzama, hold on to Fant, and I'm okay with dropping Arnold. Yeah, I saw an article a day or two ago, and I, I fell for the clickbait headline. I can't believe I fell for the clickbait, but there was something like, here is a tight end that you can pick up in your fantasy league and just play for the rest of the season. I was like, I don't think there's any people like that available. Who is that? And it was Dan Arnold. And uh, yeah, I don't think so. Dan Arnold. So I looked into it. You know, he's, he's doing stuff. The last three games, his snap count is up a lot. He's at 62% on one of them, 70 plus in the other two. He's had 23 targets the last three games, 14 catches, 159 yards. It's not nothing. It's also not everything or <laughs> many things. It's, it's a thing. It's a thing that's happening. Good for Dan Arnold. You know, Trevor Lawrence is going to throw the ball. He's going to spray it around and get some guys. So he's he's a guy that's thrown to his tight end a lot. Like that was at, at Clemson. You watch him, a lot of tight end action, a lot of short passes. So I don't hate Dan Arnold. These three guys to me are just like, they're, they're, they're the same thing. They're, they're all three. Maybe you hope you get 40 yards and a touchdown. Maybe you get one catch for 10 yards. Yeah. You just don't know. We don't know. We have no way to tell you like, Sorry, that's, that's, that's just how it goes. So it, the good thing I'm here, we're about at the point of the season where I would especially be looking at tight end, you know, like one of those little grids with tight end matchups and who are the teams, you know, some teams just don't cover tight ends very well. And you have to be careful early in the season because like, oh, you're terrible against tight ends. No, you played Travis Kelsey. So that was why your numbers are bad against tight ends. But eight weeks in, like those charts actually are pretty helpful at this point. So to me, these guys are all there. Nobody here is somebody that I'm like begging to keep on my roster. Fant, Uzama, Arnold. It's all just look at the matchup, find the best matchup there and play it. So yeah, I, I don't think that, you know, we talked last week about Uzama and maybe he's sell high on him and get a trade. Mm -hmm. Nobody's trading for Uzama. Let's, let's be real. Like He's, you're not getting much for him, it, it, like a, a borderline tight end starter. So I don't know. I'm, I'm just streaming these guys. I'm not hanging on to them. If I need a, a roster spot, I'm just going to play whoever looks good in the matchup. Yeah, just uh, looking quickly, it looks like Fant may have the best matchup down the, down the line of the three. So take that as you will. Arnold, I'm just saying, I, yeah, I mean, 
it's just to me, it's the inconsistency of the offense, yeah. not knowing where Urban Meyer's brain is at any given time. And then it's the matchup for me. So that's why yeah. I am okay with probably throwing him back on the waiver wire and he'll probably be there next week. So he's just yeah. a guy that I'm okay with like parting with and whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. A guy that I feel but- like has the athleticism and upside. He doesn't have the quarterback <laughs> or <laughs> necessarily coaching or whatever, but he does have at least more upside, I think, than the other guys. Yeah. So I'm hanging yeah, I think to me, to me, these names, once, once you get outside of the top, like five or six tight ends, to me, tight end is just defense. Like I'm just, I'm 100% streaming. Like if, if I have one of the top names, like tight end for me is either set it and forget it. Like that's the goal, get somebody in my lineup. So I never have to think about it. And I know they're still going to have an off game every now and then, but just play it and move on. Or if it's not, then I'm going the complete other end of the spectrum. Like I do with defense and just get rid of it every week, find the right matchup, pick a guy and hope that you get lucky with it. So I think that's where all three of these guys fall for me is just get the matchup if you can, otherwise move on with things. Cool. Well, let us move on to some questions. I know we are a little bit long-winded so far, so we'll try (laughs) to keep the question answers a little shorter than usual. Yeah. So we have a lot of questions about Derrick Henry too. So I think that we'll be getting some similar discussions here. So Mm -hmm. start out from William says, hi, Samantha. So I just lost Derrick Henry. Didn't we all we Derrick Henry seems to be gone and not coming back anytime soon. So here's, here's where William's at. He's got AJ Dillon and Javante Williams, which he knows is not going to cut it. He's got a lot of good receivers, Justin Jefferson, CD lamb, Debo Samuel. It's a great start. Michael Pittman, Devante Smith, Jameson Crowder. So he's wondering what really he should do here. He's got offers for guys like Zach Moss or James Conner coming in. He's being offered those guys for one of Jefferson, Lamb, or Samuel, but feels like he should be getting more for them. Spoiler alert, yes. yes. So where does Will go with this team? What, what does he do to solve the running back issue? Well, you obviously need to make a trade, Will, but I I mean, don't let it the desperation smell from, you know, from 10 <laughs> miles away. Like you cannot sell Jefferson lamb or Samuel who are all wide receiver ones rest of season for a guy like Moss or Connor. They are both serviceable RB twos. I think they will finish top 24 at their positions. Connor has been getting a ton of goal line work. Moss is at least more consistent than double Devin Singletary. So there's that. But I think you're selling way, way, way low on those receivers. So as much as I hate it, I would probably say like the guy that you may want to put on the block is Michael Pittman. I really like him rest of season. But that said, you may be able to kind of like sell a little high on him right now, just since he's looked so phenomenal now he might actually be that phenomenal rest of season, but I just don't know what you would get for Devonta Smith or Jameson Crowder. Like, I don't think you're getting a startable running back in exchange for one of those guys. And then I definitely don't think you should be trading Justin Jefferson or CD lamb, unless you're getting a RB one in exchange. And then Devo Samuel, you probably can't deal right now because he's banged up. So there's kind of a number of things, even Justin Jefferson, like you're selling low on him after one stinky game. Yeah. I think. So, um, I think that you just need to send out some better trade offers and uh, reject those because I, I would, (laughs) I would cry on your behalf if you took Zach Moss in exchange for Justin Jefferson. (laughs) Yeah. We made a lot of Jefferson and Moss comparisons over the last couple of years, but that's Randy Moss that we're doing comparison (laughs) to and not Zach. So yeah, not the right trade for me. I actually would go, well, here's the main thing you need to be, well, you need to be proactive and make trade offers. The offers that people are coming to you with, look, I make those offers. I'm the guy, I'll admit to it, I'll own it. I'm the guy that's like, ah, you need a running back? Here's one of my crappy running backs. I'll take your star receiver. Like those are terrible offers. Don't be that guy. Sometimes it starts the conversation and you never know. Sometimes the will in your league just snap accepts that offer and now you have a star receiver. So I get it. But I think that the answer here you're not going to get great trade offers if you're a will in the spot. If you're the team that suddenly lost Henry and looks desperate, people aren't coming to you with like real good intentions. You'd be like, hey, sorry, buddy, you lost your running back. Here, let me help you out. Here's a very good trade that will help you. And I'll just take a, you know, a bad receiver or something like here. I'll take Jamison Crowder. Which one of my running backs do you want? Let's, let's even our teams out. That's just not fair. Like, no, that's not what's happening. So 
I think be proactive. I would go the other way. I actually say we like Pittman. I agree with you. I'm going to use the strength of the receiving depth here to my advantage. I'm going to put Pittman into my lineup and I'm going to trade one of the star receivers Mm -hmm. and shop them around and look for the star running back. Like getting a, a Zach Moss that did nothing to your season. Like that didn't move the needle. You know, the names that he currently has, it's not really going to improve a whole lot. So whoever you're trading Pittman for, I think is going to be a little better, but not enough to me. If if you're trying to make a big move to save the season with Henry out, and I think that that's fair, I think I'd rather do a big move. So I would be looking, I'd be proactive. I would say, okay, what running backs do I want? And start at the top of the list. I want Austin Eckler. Great. So does everybody. Start with that and offer your best receiver here. I lost Henry. Here's my best receivers. I'll give you any one of them for Eckler. Are you interested? He probably says no, but you never know if you don't ask. That's what we're learning on this one too. So I would start high on those running backs and work my way down, not start on the bottom and see if you can get something better. Um, So yeah, I think I don't mind trading one of these stars here and using the depth to your advantage. I would rather do that, I think, than trade the depth for something that's not going to move the needle too much for me. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I mean, I I like that approach too as well. I think uh, if you're going to maybe shop someone, maybe CD Lamb might be the good guy to shop just because I don't know if people are going to overreact to one bad game from Justin Jefferson and maybe you're not getting full value for him is the only thing. Um, So maybe shop him. And then, like I said, with Samuel, that might be a little harder to shop him, but, and he's been phenomenal this season. So hopefully that is not a serious injury and you can get by with Jefferson, Samuel and Pittman as your three receivers. And I would be super stoked if that was my receiving core. So yeah, um, definitely yeah. explore those avenues. Here, as well. Here's another little trade trick that I like to do too. Don't be afraid to offer a couple of deals. Like get CD Lamb or Justin Jefferson out there, even if it's a deal that you know they're probably going to reject, like a deal, you know, Austin Eckler for one of those guys. They're not going to take that deal. Get those offers out there because what if Justin Jefferson has a huge game this week? Every person who had a chance to get him and didn't and click the no button is going to have a little like buyer's remorse or non buyer's remorse of like, oh man, didn't I just have an offer for that guy? Like, I love to just get offers out there of like, here's a guy you could have had. You said, no, look at the big game that he had. Because sometimes those people come back the next week and are willing to, to talk on a deal that they might not have otherwise. So that's just a little thing I like to do. Kind of, you know, put a little blood in the water a little bit. See if people come running back sometimes. All right. Uh, let's go to Ehan. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. But they write, is it time to give up on Antonio Gibson? He's clearly talented, but only get... 33% of the snaps in week eight, despite being off the injury report for the first time since week three. So what do you think on Gibson? Are you out on him this year? Depends on what you mean by give up on. I am not dropping him. I think he would be snatched up in a second. Uh, he is a rest of season RB two, I think, which obviously that's not, that's not something that you're happy about if you drafted him as an RB one, but that said, like, there's not a lot of RB2 caliber dudes rest of season just floating around on your waiver wire. So I'm benching him probably like against Tampa off the bye or even against Carolina. I, if you have better options, I understand benching him, but then he has a cakewalk schedule after that. It's Seattle, Las Vegas, Dallas, Philly, Dallas again, and then Philly again. And then the Giants, if you happen to play into week 18, but we're not going to talk about those people. So stay the course. I don't think, I mean, you obviously can't trade him at his absolute nadir. So you might as well ride it out. I think he is absolutely still worth a spot on your bench. Uh, Yes, he was off the injury report, but I don't know how much that really means because obviously he's not 100%. I think it's something that could heal over the season and the schedule's good and the talent is good. So I'm not dropping him for like a guy like Jeremy McNichols or something like that. Yeah, for sure. I agree with what you said. I think even though Gibson is off the injury report, it seems relatively clear that, you know, all the stuff that he's got going on with his leg and everything seems like it's still bothering him and limiting the snaps, even if it's not necessarily going to cost him, you know, actual game time or, or game to game time. So yeah. I think you just have to write it out and play him. I I can't imagine a spot where he's droppable. He's too valuable for that. 
I also don't know that I would be targeting him in trades as a buy low guy either. Even with the schedule, I think you're just kind of stuck writing it out at this point with him. All right. From Tommy. Tommy wants to know, do I trade Lockett, Tyler Lockett, for Elijah Mitchell? Uh, he's another one who needs to replace Derrick Henry here. So he's got Cup, Judy, and Pittman as his receivers besides Lockett. What do you think about your guy, Mike Kyle Shanahan, Elijah Mitchell? I actually like this trade for a number of reasons, your, your needs, obviously, but first your receivers are really solid. And I think you can do without Lockett. Mitchell is a stud and should be a high end RB2 rest of season. In my opinion, even when Jeff Wilson gets back, I think we have seen, seen Kyle Shanahan pull Shanahan again in the past, but we've also seen him commit to guys like Raheem Mostert and give them a lot of carries. And I think this is a team that will be running a lot anyway. They like to run. They like to utilize other running backs. So Jeff Wilson will be sprinkled in if he ever gets back. Uh, Lockett, on the other hand, to me, is a sell high, which may, may be counterintuitive. I mean, obviously he had a really good game last week with Geno Smith. Weird. Uh, and it may be counterintuitive because Russ is coming back and you're like, wait, hold on. I literally held on to lock it through the Geno Smith period and you're telling me to sell him now when Russ is coming back I just think he's like a boomer bust type guy no matter who the quarterback is and it's weird it's not like a he's not like a Deshaun Jackson guy where he's like oh he might get the one like 70 yard catch and a touchdown type thing it just like happens to be that it is a Tyler Lockett game or it isn't a Tyler Lockett game he might get 10 targets and he might get one and that is concerning for me uh so I think he's a fine wide receiver too rest of season but since you really need a running back if you lost Derrick Henry I think this trade makes sense yeah I like Elijah Mitchell he's a nice trade target if you're if you're looking for a guy he's the sort of guy you know every year we get down to that last like six weeks and there's a few names where it's the top 10 running backs over that stretch you're like wait who this guy who <laughs> wasn't even drafted in my league yeah. Elijah Mitchell looks like that sort of player to me like he could be a guy that booms. Here's my question. So I like I like targeting him. So Tommy has Cooper Cup. Obviously, you're not going to trade him. But between Lockett, Judy, and Pittman, let's say that the Elijah Mitchell guy has said, I just need a receiver. Which receiver? Just give me one of your receivers for Mitchell. Is Lockett the one of those guys that you would trade? Or would you rather trade one of the others if you could? Ooh, I might trade Judy. Only because of my concerns about the Denver offense. Uh Pittman, I'm, I've been very high on and Lockett at least I think has a little higher upside. Judy, I'm not sure is a hundred percent from the ankle thing. I mean, he didn't have a fantastic, uh, return from, from injury. So I guess it would have to be, it would be Judy for me if I had to drop one of them, but that said, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with Judy as one of my receivers. I think he's like a high end wide receiver three rest of season. Yeah, I agree with you on that. That my only hesitation on this deal is I'm a little higher, I think, than you on Tyler Lockett. I, I would rather hang on him if I could. You don't get to make choices when you lose Derrick Henry and have to make a deal. If you do have the choice, I, I agree. I think I I would probably rather have Lockett, I think, than Judy and even than Pittman. I, I kind of like him with Wilson looking like he should be back now. So he's he's not a must hold. If you have to trade him to get Elijah Mitchell, then you got to do it. You know, you gotta take some chances sometimes. But yeah, I think. Judy, I would rather trade if it's an option. So it's, you know, Elijah is a good, good target for him. All right. Uh, let's go to Jason. Jason asks, is there any real reason to keep holding Chris Carson? A lot of Seahawks questions today. <laughs> would Jeff Wilson be a better IR stash? And he's got a second question, but let's start with that. So what do you think? Hold on to Chris Carson, or would you rather have Jeff Wilson? I think I'd rather have Chris Carson. Uh, I know. So at first the outlook was very pessimistic. There was like a chance that he could miss the rest of the season, but now they're saying that he could return sooner. I think he is, I, I mean, he's not the sexiest name for fantasy, but he's offering some, if, if both of them being healthy, he offers me much more upside than Jeff Wilson does, especially with the way Elijah Mitchell has been playing. So I think that Carson is at least a better bench stash because like these IR stashes, you don't want to be stashing like an, a guy who when he's healthy is maybe an RB three. Like you want to be stashing a guy that at least has a, a little more upside than that. So that's where I would go. I would probably go Carson over Jeff Wilson in the IR slot. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. There's there, to me, there's not a lot of upside to Jeff Wilson. Like what you said, like there's, 
there's nothing much to hang on to. If he comes back and is healthy and gets some touches for a few games, now you pick him up, but there's really not a lot to hold on to there. So you're right. Chris Carson is not a sexy name, but neither is Ryan. We get a lot of messages from him each time we do this. So I would hang on to Chris Carson. Hope that Seattle bounces back a little bit here. All right. Part two of Jason's questions. Other than Hunter Renfro, are any other Raiders receivers worth rostering in a 10 team PPR league? What do you think? I mean, Brian Edwards definitely comes to mind. He is a guy that um, before the bye had a touchdown. And I think he's a sexy name in the, in the fantasy community. Everyone wants it to be Brian Edwards season. And he could have the opportunity now that there are a lot of targets freed up here. So I think in a 10 team league, that's tough because that is extremely shallow. There's a good chance that he's just like floating around. He's just a guy, but um, if there's going to be someone, obviously it's Edwards and I would consider it if you, if you just have the space to, I don't know what your bench situation looks like, but he is also an upside play. I think just with uh, the the Raiders offense have being very pass heavy and Derek Carr playing really well. So uh, I'm going to go with Brian Edwards. Yeah. I think Edwards is the guy he's probably a spot start sort of guy. Like I, I don't know that I would stash him and keep him around. Yeah, I don't hate it, but he's a guy that's going to kind of sit on the edge of my roster or off of waivers, but I don't mind picking him up. If you got a good matchup for the week, or if you, you know, need a bye week fill in or that sort of thing, I think he's probably the other guy to keep an eye on. Awesome. Well, should we move on to our prize picks? Let's do it. All right. So uh, next up here is our elite entry segment where we dive into the prize picks app to build some entries. And by we, I mean, Brandon, uh, Brandon is going to identify some markets. He likes you guys are going to build your own prize picks entries and all of us have a little fun and make some money except me because prize picks is illegal in Colorado <laughs> of all the states of all the states. Everything is legal here. But anyway, we are going to look at some Thursday night plays for week nine on prize picks hit us with what you like, Brandon. All right. Thursday night, we got the Jets, Mike White's New York football Jets. Let's go. <laughs> so hilariously, Mike White has, if, if you throw out a number of attempts, Mike White is like the MVP of the NFL right now. Like <laughs> if you're looking at quarterback metrics, I, I, I looked at the chart of his like EPA and completion percentage over expectation, like all the nerd numbers. <laughs> if you put all the nerd numbers together, Mike White is like off the edge of the chart. Like you can barely even fit his dot on there. And then you're like, you come back a little ways and you zoom out and you're like, oh, okay. There's Tom Brady and there's Josh Allen, Pat Mahomes, and then all the rest of the guys. And then Mike White just out there by himself. So yeah, let's, let's just say that that probably was a one game thing. We're very happy for you, Mike White. We had a lot of fun. I posted a lot of survivor gifts on Sunday, enjoying Mike White, he was the name of a contestant a few years ago. Yes, the same guy that was the White Lotus director. So my take on this game is that we're probably not getting that Mike White again. We're probably not getting that Jets team again. So I'm going heavy on a running back for each team in this game. So I'll start with the Jets and we're talking about Mike White. So Mike White had, you know, I keep saying the two names. He seems like a two name guy, right? Mike White, like it can't just be White, it's, it's the whole name. So he last week, despite the efficiency, his average depth of target was only 3.5 yards. This is a check down machine and credit where it's due. Zach Wilson wasn't doing that. But what we've seen right away is that those running backs are catching a ton of passes for the Jets right away. And I think the game script is going to favor that happening again. The Jets are double digit underdogs here. I think that they're not going to overcome that this week. They're probably going to be behind a lot in this game. So that's the script I'm playing here. And I want a lot of Michael Carter in my lineup this week. So Michael Carter has had some big games. Last week, he had nine catches for 95 yards. The week before that, he had eight catches for 67 yards, 23 targets those two weeks. Again, he's getting these targets. He's, you know, Mike White is getting him the ball in these short you know, passes and then letting Carter do things from there. He's making him look good. So why would he stop doing that? So I am playing Michael Carter three different ways this time. Michael Carter, the third. Yeah, that seems like a thing. Let's do that. So I'm taking Michael Carter over four and a half receptions. Again, nine catches last week, eight the week before. So 
last week, Carter and Ty Johnson had 20 targets between them. So I like the over four and a half catches. I'm also taking Carter to go over 35 and a half receiving yards. You get all those catches. You're going to get some yards. Maybe you break one. You could do that pretty easily. And I'm taking Michael Carter over 12 fantasy points. He had 32 fantasy points last week. The weeks before that, he had 18, 15, and 10. If you round them, average to 19 over the last four weeks. So I like Carter. I like him catching a lot of a lot of those short, little, non-sexy Mike White passes this week. So I'm doing all three of those. On the other side of the ball, I am taking some Jonathan Taylor. Taylor is playing very well. If you look at the numbers, so I expect the Colts to win here. I know that that could be a problem because we often expect the Colts to win, and they often don't. The Jets rank dead last in EPA on rushing defense over the last four games. That's behind the Chargers. That's not good. So their rushing defense is not getting the job done. If you look at Colts games, Jonathan Taylor's three biggest games have come in the three Colts wins. So I expect that to look like this game. The Jets are going to have a lot of dump offs and passing. The Colts are going to be running the ball and just being like, Mike White's not going to beat us. Our defense will get the job done. Let's just hand the ball off and run the clock. So I like Jonathan Taylor over 80 and a half rushing yards. He's at 103, 107, 145 in the three wins. And I'm taking Taylor to score a touchdown. Honestly, I can't believe that we can just do that over half of a touchdown. He scored in five straight games, and he has six touchdowns in that span. So he's the most likely anytime touchdown scorer here. So I definitely love adding that in there. So two Taylor overs, three Carter overs, all in on two running backs. I like stacking these together because they're not independent. If one of them hits, the others are more likely to hit. So if we play all five, if we hit them all, we make our money times 10. So $20 on those five, hit them all, you win $200, miss one, we still double up. I think this is our week. We're going to win some money this week. I feel so good about this week. Uh, not only because I love these two players, because I really do. Um, like Michael Carter is a guy that unfortunately I dropped in, I think one league, but I have mm. held on to him in most my, of most of my formats. And I'm super happy about that. Obviously he was a monster last week. Mike white is just, I mean, he, he's, obviously just passing a lot to the running backs so he's turning carter kind of into like carter and ty johnson into these little like slot receivers which i'm okay with for fantasy obviously even more points um so yeah i'm happy about that you're high on him and then jonathan taylor is just a guy that i have been high on since the draft so and yeah. people were so down on him at the beginning of the year it was like a like a kyle pitts type thing like people wanted to be down on on jonathan taylor they were like oh he's so overhyped i can't believe i literally took him in like the back half of the second round like i mm. the two like the 212 pick or whatever um wow. in, in one league last year and like I got lambasted all over Twitter for this so obviously it was a little high on him but he finished out the season super strong and he picked up where he left off and he's catching passes so I am all about this so lock it in guys um do you want to just recap really quick so um everyone can yes. just so I'm gonna I'll skip the numbers but just so you can hear the stats again so Jonathan Taylor's over on his rushing yards over on rushing touchdowns Michael Carter over on his receptions and receiving yards over on his fantasy points. Awesome. Well, just as a reminder, guys, you can obviously mix and match fantasy points and player props to make your lineups super spicy. Also, prize fix markets move. So you will want to be nimble to lock in the best numbers. If you have not created a prize fix account yet, please check out the link in our episode description because prize fix has a special offer for fantasy flex listeners. They will match your first deposit up to $100. Use that money. Go bet this and just click the link in our episode description or visit prizefix.com and use promo code action 10. All right, let us just keep it moving here on our mailbag episode. All right, we got a few more questions here. A couple more Derrick Henry's too. So back to Derrick Henry from less. Should I drop Derrick Henry now or should I hold on to him? Obviously, that's a question that people have probably in every league across the country. So what are you doing with Derrick Henry? Yeah, I got asked this a million times on TikTok Live last night. And uh, 
Oof. I mean, I would use an IR spot on him in the unlikely event that he makes it back in time for the fantasy playoffs. Eight weeks, which is the, I think, estimate, and even that, that's that's a, that's a short turnaround. That puts him right at week 17. So wasting a bench spot on him, though, carries a lot of assumptions. It assumes you are making it all the way to the fantasy finals. It also assumes that, that the Titans are competitive enough that they are vying for a playoff spot and are willing to risk re-injuring Henry um, that quick of uh, like the turnaround. Like if this season gets away from them, which it could, like the Colts could just run away from with this. I don't, I don't necessarily think they will, but it, this season could get away from them. Um, they may not want to put him out there if, if it's already a lost cause. And then it also assumes that Derrick Henry is back to full strength come week 17 or week 18, if you are playing into week 18 on a short timeline. So that is a lot of assumptions. Obviously, first of all, in Dynasty Keeper, yes, you obviously have to keep him. But in for normal redraft, I would probably keep an IR spot if I think I'm like a really good contender, but I'm not wasting a bench spot. Yeah, I mean, you have to keep him. If you have a spot, if you have IR, this that's what the IR, IR spot is for. But I, I have very little hope here for Derrick Henry the rest of the season. I, I just don't think he's going to play again. You know, we talked about Derrick Henry on, on this podcast a couple of weeks ago. So do, do we do, are we, do we allow victory laps on here? Do I get the victory lap for telling people to trade Derrick Henry a couple of weeks ago? I don't know. You don't know. get to victory lap injuries, but yes, it was prescient of you to tell people to trade him. Yeah, we, we don't, we do not celebrate injuries, but I do think I honestly, I would still be trying to trade Derrick Henry if I had him. Like I would rather trade for any, if you're giving me anything positive for him, anything, like literally anything. I like your kicker. Can I have your kicker? Here's Derrick Henry. You use your spot on him. You stash him. Yeah. I just don't think that I'm going to get anything out of him. Like even, like even in the best case scenario, it's week 16. You're in your fantasy semifinals. Derrick Henry is back, but we have no idea what he's doing. Right. You're really just putting him right back into your lineup. I just, I, I don't know. I don't see it. So I'm not going to get rid of him. That's what the spots are there for. If it's an actual roster spot and I have to choose either Henry or other people who might actually help my team, boy, I'm really trying to trade him and clear up that roster spot because I just, I don't know if it's coming back. I agree. Dynasty keeper, like you got to keep him around for that, but I, I don't have high hopes for him. Fair enough. I know it, it will hurt to it will. actually have to move on from him, but. Uh... It's rough. What, what We haven't talked about Adrian Peterson. So I want to know. I'm a Vikings fan. So I think we know my thoughts on Adrian Peterson. What do you think about Adrian Peterson? Like how valuable, I'm sure you've talked a lot about him in your waiver articles and, and everything this week. Where are you at on Peterson? For people who are listening, how how high should they be on him? I mean, he's, he's a guy, he's a warm body that you can put in your lineup. I think that I am valuing him as a RB3 in that territory. So he's not a super exciting start. There's going to be volume, I think, but how much volume? Not sure. The Titans could really pivot in terms of like passing volume more. And then I think he will get some goal line carries. Like he's, he's the king of like the, you know, one touchdown, sorry, one yard touchdown guy. Uh, so I could definitely see that. I think he is valuable. And I think if you needed a running back, you should have gone out and gotten him this, this, this week, but I wouldn't expect, I'm not, I don't have super, super high expectations. So I think RB three is like, it's, it's a fair range for him. I think I'm a little higher than you, but it's hard to say because Peterson literally is one of my favorite players ever as a Vikings yeah. fan. But I do think that if he has legs still, and he's proven that he has over the last year as he comes back and can run a little bit, he is a similar ish style. Like he does seem more like for like than a lot of players they could have gotten for, for Derek to fill in for Derek Henry. He is the sort of guy that, you know, the Titans, let's be honest, they like to just hand it off to Derek Henry on some inefficient first half carries to kind of batter the defense and wear them down and then be able to plow later in the game. That's kind of what this stage of career Peterson is. So I, I don't hate it. I, I think to me, he's an RB two. I, I would I would be very happy if I picked up Peterson this week. He's not going to win my league for me, but I would feel until proven otherwise, I would feel like he's probably going to get me 15, 20 touches a week. He's going to get some of those touchdowns. We know the Titans emphasize the run game and there aren't a lot of other options there. So 
I don't hate it. I'm going to pretty much put him in my lineup and keep him there until we see production and show otherwise. But, you know, he's not the old Adrian Peterson. He's certainly not going to do Derrick Henry things, unfortunately. I think you're letting your Vikings bias show. That's possible. <laughs> it is, it's happened before. <laughs> All right. Uh, we got another IR question from Let's Go Terps on Calvin Ridley. So they have Calvin Ridley for this season and next. Do they have to keep him on IR and hope that he returns? Yeah. I, obviously, we have no idea what he is dealing with or the extent of that. We wish him well and hope he gets the need, the help that he needs. This is a little more nebulous than Calvin Ridley going out with an ACL injury, because at least we know that's a year turned around or like something like that. We really don't know. But for keeper reasons, of course, you need to hang on to him. He has sky high potential and he could be back next season. We re- like, I know it's just, it's a crappy answer that like, we don't know, but we don't. And yeah, it's, it's kind of an uncharted territory type thing where we don't like have, there is no playbook on how to deal with players who are stepping away from the game, but there's a good chance that he could come back. And I think that is worth keeping him in an IR spot. Yeah. Here, here's my take. Mental health is important. Take care of yourself. We hope Kelvin Ridley is okay. We hope that he takes the time that he needs. I'd keep him around in your roster. He obviously is very talented. And especially if you got him for next year, you've got to keep him, especially if you get to put him on IR, pretty easy decision there. But, you know, take care of yourself. Kelvin Ridley, take care of yourself. I'm sure that you're listening today to our podcast. Kelvin so, Ridley's grandmother is probably listening. That's true. This very, we have to, we are the number one fantasy podcast for grandmothers. Khalif Raymond's grandma. Hi, hello. <laughs> All right, a couple more. Donnie V, another Derrick Henry question here. What do we think about Ryan Tannehill's value with Henry going down? Do you think value goes up for Tannehill? We talked about this briefly in PhD. I think it's difficult. It's yes, but not by as much as I think some people are going to make it out to be. I think, of course, the team is going to have to deleverage themselves somewhat from the run game because obviously there's a monumental downgrade from Derrick Henry to Adrian Peterson and Jeremy McNichols. Um, And they won't have the security blanket of just always being able to give it to him. But I do have concerns about the way the Titans have looked this season. Now, yes, to your point, they have looked better over the last few weeks, but I just don't know how much they can lean in on this passing game. Like, I don't think this means Tannehill is going to go for 300 yards and three touchdowns every game, just given the way that he has played and the offensive line has struggled. So that's not all his fault, but all of this kind of spells for, I think it helps, but not nearly as much as I think people are making it out to be. I don't think this is going to be this super, super pass heavy team. Now, I think this is great news for AJ Brown and Julio Jones, if he can ever get healthy, but yeah, we talked about it. Ray Bell is going to lean on a committee and I could see this turning into some kind of like Ravens esque situation where there's just like a bunch of guys and they combine for a number of touches while none of them are actually attractive for fantasy. So I think Tannehill puts himself like, back into that fringe quarterback one conversation, which before this, he was probably like a little bit outside it um, in the right matchups. So I'm, I I think he's good. And I think if you see someone though, like in your league, really like that you think may overreact to this, this is something that I think you could kind of like go against. And uh, I just do think that there are people that see this and they'll, they'll be like, Oh, this plus this equals this. And it's actually like a little more nuanced because I don't think they're just going to all of a sudden become this really pass heavy team. Yeah, I agree. Like that. I think what you're saying is if you are the Ryan Tannehill owner and someone comes to you on a trade being like, Oh man, like they think that they're pulling one over on you because they're going to grab Ryan Tannehill and he's about to explode. (laughs) Yeah. He's not about to explode. I think you're right. Like AJ Brown and Julio Jones, they're the winners here. And we Mm -hmm. talked about, you know, a couple of weeks ago, keeping Julio in case Derrick Henry was down like there's, there's volume potential for the receivers. I think Tannehill will be fine. We talked about him. I, I think he'll be a fringe QB one. Maybe he moves up a little bit, like half of a tier basically. But yeah, if you have a, if, if you have him and someone's trying to, to sneak him off of you, I, I would sell high. Like mm-hmm. the, the, before he actually plays without Derrick Henry is when you sell high on Ryan Tannehill, because it's not like they're going to come out and suddenly like go five wide and be passing it 50 times a game. That's just not what they're going to do. So, you know, it's a, it's a little better, but I wouldn't get so too excited about it. Um, All right. Last one is from Quentin. Quentin says, Hey, I need your help. I had Derrick Henry in my lineup, but 
well, I can't count on him for a few weeks. Oh, Quentin, bless your heart. <laughs> a few weeks, my friend. Yes, it's just yeah. a few weeks. Just it's a few weeks until Christmas and New Year's. This is the same <laughs> few weeks we're talking about here. So here's what Quentin has. He's got Zach, is, is Zach Moss a viable RB2, at least for week nine? He's got Aaron Jones and DeAndre Swift as top two guys. He has McNichols on his bench. So he used to put Henry and Jones at running back and Swift at flex. He's now thinking Jones and Swift at running back. And then his other options are Moss, McNichols, or Adam Thielen, or Jalen Waddell. So who do we think should be his long-term flex? Thanks in advance for our advice, Quentin. I'll probably go through this. Like There are a lot of layers of this. It's a lot. Yes. <laughs> I do think Moss can be a viable low ceiling RB2 rest of season like he he's a guy that's getting volume but not necessarily reaching his potential because Josh Allen is that team's best running back um he is a good play this week against Jacksonville so I will definitely put him in that RB2 high end RB2 conversation um for week nine you're obviously going to be without Swift so uh I would say your running backs are going to be Jones and Moss and then I would definitely use Adam Thielen in your flex that's like a a slam dunk for me. So week 10 onwards, I'm going to say go Swift and Jones as your backs and then Thielen in your flex. I would consider Thielen a better play than both Moss and McNichols and Waddle is a better play than McNichols too. So um, yeah, definitely Adam Thielen as your long-term flex play. Yeah, I agree. I, I guess I would think of it more as Adam Thielen is my default flex play more so than long term. Like I'm not going to hesitate to pull him out if I get a better matchup that week. All my running backs are healthy and I want to get them all in there. Sure. But yeah, Thielen jumps out out of that list of guys is like, yeah, he's the guy that you if, if no one else stands out, just just put Thielen out there. He probably have a chance at a touchdown and, and see if he does some good things. So, yeah, uh, of our many listeners. I think that Quentin is in good shape here among our Derrick Henry owners. I think Quentin, you got a shot here. You can get through this. You don't have to be quite so creative. You've got some options on your roster. Otherwise, for the rest of you, Derrick Henry owners, it's rough. You did not ask for this. You just got to be creative. And, and you know, this is a game. We're, we're playing a game and we don't know. The thing about fantasy football is we truly don't know. And sometimes that's frustrating. If you're the person that had Derrick Henry, and now you have to figure something else out. You just have to take hope in the not knowing and try some stuff. Like try to find a player that looks interesting. Try to find someone that has some upside. Take a shot on a one for two deal if you need to. This is the chance where you might do that when you are when you lost here, Henry. You got to take some chances and we don't know. You, you never know who is going to be great. And so that's that's the upside. That's That's my hope for you, Derek Henry owners is that we never know. Adrian Peterson could come in and, and be revitalized. Jeremy McNichols might suddenly learn how to run the ball this week after all these years. We don't know. We think that we know things, but we don't know. And next week, we'll, we'll have some more advice for you based on the new things we learned this week. My boyfriend woke up on Monday to the Derrick Henry news, obviously. And <laughs> he's just like, so he doesn't play fantasy football at all. And he is a blind Browns fan, just like, that's all he cares about. Doesn't probably doesn't know the names of any other players that <laughs> either did not play, have never played for the Browns or never played for Ohio state. So that's, that's where we are. Uh, and yeah, he just goes like, well, don't you just win fantasy football if all your players don't get hurt? And I was like, wow, like I'm going to just tweet that out. Like that is some Illuminati uh, advice here. Just, just draft the players that don't get hurt. I mean, uh, yeah, obviously I Derek Henry had no real indication here. Of course, there were concerns about durability and stuff, but uh, he is a guy that has been extremely dur durable. So even if you are saying, you know, don't draft the guys that don't have injury history, he would have probably been the guy you were drafting. So uh, definitely a bummer, but uh, it sounds like our guy Quentin is, like you said, in not a terrible situation. So Anyway, that'll do it for this very long mailbag episode. As a reminder, Sean Kerner and Chris Rabon are here on the Fantasy Flex every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, giving you guys all the DFS, waiver wire, and rankings info to help you dominate your fantasy leagues. I will be back next Tuesday with another round of 21 questions uh, and next Thursday with another mailbag episode. So don't forget, please send any mailbag questions my way to mailbag at actionnetwork.com. 
Thanks again for listening. Please rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts. Download us wherever you like to listen, and we will see you next time on the Fantasy Flex presented by Prize Fix. Peace out, y'all. 